Please be seated. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence this morning. And we pray that we would sense your presence among us, that you would bring great peace and great focus, great joy to our hearts this morning as we share this time. We pray that we would sense your presence in a very, very precious way. Uh, Lord, as we just sang a little bit earlier, you are life to our heart and our soul, and you're the light uh, uh, to those around us and uh, to the darkness within us, uh, and you bring hope, uh, hope to our own hearts, hope to those who are broken, uh, hope to those who have no hope, and we're so thankful and we're so blessed that you've drawn us this morning. Uh, that we have the health to be here, uh, that you've given us the grace to be here. And we pray that our, uh, our hearts would just overflow with great, great joy that we could be in your presence and that we could be with other saints this morning. Uh, we pray uh, that our fellowship would encourage each of our hearts uh, as we look uh, to the God of our salvation, uh, the God, our God who reigns, uh, that we uh, would be lifted up, that our hearts would be, uh, that our hearts would soar, uh, that our thoughts uh, would be lifted heavenward, uh, that we would uh, be energized, uh, renewed of heart, mind, body, soul, and spirit. And that we would walk out of this place, Lord, uh, with a different perspective than what we've uh, brought in here today. Uh, so thank you so very, very much that you've given us everything uh, it, with, uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything for life and godliness. Uh, you've given it all to us, Lord. May we um, be ever mindful of that. Uh, may we not run after other things, uh, thinking that those things will make us happy. Uh, thank you uh, for that reminder that you um, shared with us through Harold this morning. Um, if we're struggling for happiness, uh, just look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, also, Father, too, I want to lift up uh, those in our church family that are struggling physically, uh, especially think of Mike Shirtliff, Lord. Um, encourage his heart. Um, may he sense your presence. Um, thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, uh, to, to Mike. And I also want to lift up Carol this morning as well. Uh, bless her heart. Uh, thank you so much for her faith, uh, the strength that you've given her, uh, the love that you've shed abroad in her heart. Now, also, Lord, for uh, Sandy Sherman as well. Uh, for what she goes through daily. Um, we, we bless you uh, that she's so faithful to fix her eyes and her hope upon you. Also, Lord, too, we ask uh, that you would touch Fred, Fred Legler's legs, uh, that you would uh, bring healing as uh, only you can do. Uh, also, Lord, too, um, there are so many uh, things upon our hearts and our lives here this morning. Uh, we can't even begin to uh, enumerate them, um, express them properly. Thank you that your Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf when we struggle to do so. Uh, thank you that he knows all about tomorrow. 
thank you, Lord, that you uh, constantly live to make intercession for us and um, bring things before the throne of grace that we're totally oblivious to, especially in regards to our sanctification. We thank you, Lord, that, um, that you constantly live and, and pray for us to that end. May we uh, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and we pray in his name. Amen. Okay, we have um, our scripture reading this morning. Bill? Our first reading this morning is actually two short readings, one from Galatians and one from the second chapter of Corinthians, a second book of Corinthians. Galatians is chapter 2. Verses 19 to 21, and that's found on page 1129 of the Red Church Bible. For through the law, I died for God. Excuse me, let me start over. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And our second reading from the second chapter, a uh, second book of Corinthians, the fifth chapter, on page 1122, verses 14 and 15. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. This is the word of our Lord. Amen. This morning's second scripture reading, also from the New Testament, from John's Gospel, from the 15th chapter of John's Gospel. I'll be reading the first 11 verses. And if you're using the church Bible, that can be found on page 1046. Again, the first 11 verses of the 15th chapter of John's Gospel. And the Lord says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, 
so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So says the word of our Lord. I absolutely love that parable. A great passage of scripture. Isn't that the theme, Jerry? <laughs> Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, use this time uh, to uh, give us understanding into your word as your Holy Spirit can only uh, give. And we commit this time to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So folks, uh, last week I spoke to you about the exchanged life. And this is uh, part two uh, this morning. But let me just quickly summarize the uh, part of what I, uh, I shared last week in case you weren't with us. So when I spoke on the exchange life, life last week, uh, I remember it was a term that was coined by Hudson Taylor, the famous missionary to the China Inland Mission. And it nicely sums up the work of Christ in the life of the Christian. And I mentioned his upbringing and his Pentecost moment. You know, his upbringing, uh, his understanding of Christianity was that you were to do, do, and do. Well, he has this Pentecost moment, and he comes to understand that the Christian life is not doing in your own strength. It doesn't mean passivity, but it means that you live the Christian life in the strength of the power of the Holy Spirit. That was his Pentecost moment. Uh, life is to be lived in the Spirit. Now, I chronicled some of his uh, writings, his exact words, about how he struggled with sin. He was powerless in his prayer life and Christian life. He got burned out, and he actually had suicidal thoughts. That was what Hudson Taylor's service like looked like in the kingdom of God. And... I think he came to a place to understand that that's not really what Christian service is to look like. It kind of reminds me of what somebody said to me a couple of years ago. They said to me, I'm a lousy Christian. They were talking about themselves. And I said to them, I am too. And I, I somehow feel that if Hudson Taylor was a part of the conversation, I think he would say, I am three. I think he felt, felt the same way. Now, this touches on part of the problem, I think, with our Christianity today. Uh, did you notice, I am a lousy Christian? Did you notice the I part? I am a lousy Christian. It's always true when the I part is a part of our Christianity. And I think that's what Hudson Taylor came to recognize. I think that was his epiphany moment. And yet, conversely, it's not true when Jesus replaces the I. So it's all about getting rid of the I part and embracing the God part. Now, this past Wednesday at prayer and Bible study, we were looking at Genesis chapter 12, uh, God's covenanting with Abraham. And if you, and you know, probably know the scriptures, but if you were to reread verses 1 through 3, God promises seven times, he says, I will, I will, I will. That's, that was all God had to do. Uh, Abraham is not saying, I, 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 in that whole thing. It's what God has done, what he wants to do, and what he's willing to do. So in, last week, in, in talking about the exchanged life, I brought you up to the point of the cross. Um, the exchanged life through his death. It's substitutionary, it's vicarious. We got the death part. We understand that Christ takes our place at Calvary. I also mentioned this week, in a part two, that we would be looking at the resurrection part because that is the most elusive part. We have eternal life because of Jesus. We've been raised with him, but we struggle to let him live through us. Now, I was talking to somebody this past week. I love what they said. Uh, in letting him live through us, they said, actually, he wants to live for himself. 
I started to think about that. You know, I always think about, you know, God letting, uh, letting God live in me and through me. And yet, he really wants to live for himself. Now, to the resurrected part this morning. I, I come before you to tell you that I did not have a good week living the resurrected part. In fact, it was a very, very poor week. Uh, I was not happy with moments of my Christianity. And that's because a lot of eyes were involved in this past week. And, and, and you know, leading up to this message, I said, Lord, uh, I'm supposed to be able to have a good week, right? So I can own this message? That's how it works, right, Lord? And I'm here to tell you it, it doesn't work that way. Uh, there are times where I get up here and these messages are for me first. Actually, they're always for me first. They're never, they're ultimately for you, but they're always for me first. And so, it's not how it works. I didn't have a good week. Uh, and I'm not pretending this morning to own the resurrected part. I'm striving for it like you and many, many others. I, you know, it, it was so bad. It was so bad this past week. I mean, I got to the point the other day where after I sent out information, I, I thought, I'm not even preaching on this. I, I can't do it. I was ready to scrap it. Did you notice the I part? I was ready to scrap it. Because if I had my way, I would have scrapped it. Uh, Lord gave me two verses um, that, that, that allows me to get through this time. And they're applicable for all of us at any time. Philippians chapter 3 verse 12. The Apostle Paul even wrote, Not that I have already obtained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on. And he was talking about knowing Christ, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Things that I didn't know about this past week. Things that I did not enter into. And yet God gave me that verse, not that I have already obtained it. And then he also, he also gave Paul a verse uh, that Paul wrote for us, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Paul writes, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. So, this week I'm not preaching on the resurrected part. God led me to preach on something else that's important to the resurrected part. Uh, we're going to consider the through part, the exchanged part of the, 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 the through part of the exchanged life. So if you take a look at the title in the bulletin, um, it should probably read, The Exchanged Life in Death Through, and it should drop the resurrection part off. But we're going to talk about the through part. Last week was the death part. We come up to the cross. Now we're going to talk about the through part to live the Christian life. And we'll, Lord willing, do the resurrection part next week. Turn in your Bibles to... John chapter 15. I'm going to be referencing uh, several of these verses, and I'd like to have you to have your Bibles open. I've preached on this parable before, and I'm going to highlight these, some of these things, uh, some of these truths in here again. Tremendous parable. The parable of the vine and the branches addresses in many respects the through part and the resurrection part. We'll be looking at this next week as well, but keep in mind as we go through these verses, this is about the through part. Now here's the problem with this parable. I've said this before, I'll say it again. The context is often missed and dismissed. The purpose and teaching is often skewed. People will read this and they slightly twist it. And they, and they twist it to often mean something that it's not intended. When you read a parable, a parable has a central truth. There's a lot of dressing that rounds out the parable, but it always has a central truth. And you can take some of the dressing and you can draw application 
But that's not necessarily the point of the parable. When you read this parable here, it's about relational oneness, specifically spiritual fruitfulness. Now, spiritual fruitfulness is relevant because I think we all struggle to be spiritually fruitful. Now, we do some, some days, some weeks, we do better than others, amen? But we struggle consistently to be spiritually fruitful. And this is why this parable is absolutely so relevant. Now, when you read this, you get the sense that a vine has branches. Technically speaking, a vine does not have branches. A vine is a vine. A vine branches out. But there are no branches. If you uh, properly, perhaps we should say, the branches are actually offshoots of the vine. And so the imagery of the parable here is relational oneness with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the vine, and we are the vine offshoots, the branches who have oneness and are in union with him. That's the way you want to understand this parable. Now, you don't often think of oneness with God. You relationally, do you? In fact, we often think of how we're so separated and apart from God. But the scriptures teach that the church, the Christian, is one with God. Uh, Paul brings out this union in 1 Corinthians 12. The analogy of the body. There's many members, but there's one body, and we're the body of Christ. We have union. We're connected, and there's oneness. So when you look at this parable here, the context is thoroughly relational. It's not salvational. And, and it kills me because some people will take this parable and they'll twist it to upset the souls of some people where they think, oh, one day I'm saved, the next day I'm not. That what they do is they take this parable and they say, God's pruning the family tree and he's getting rid of believers who are unfruitful. Now, I want you to think about that. Would God ever get rid of you? Would, would God ever throw you to the curb? Not on your very, very worst day or worst week. He would never do that. In fact, he bids us to come to him just as we are. Every day, daily. And so what happens is they say, well, God's getting rid of unfruitful believers and therefore those people are unsaved. And here's the problem with that interpretation. When you look at this context, that is an absolute impossibility. Properly understanding the parable here, take a look. God is the vine dresser. He's the gardener. Christ is the vine. Disciples are the offshoot. And so if you take a look at verse 1, I, I, that explains it. I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. And what is the activity of God? Verse 2, the activity of God is to prune the vine. Now, he's not talking about pruning Christ because Christ doesn't need spiritual pruning. <laughs> we do. And so he prunes those who are connected and have oneness with Christ. And if by way of analogy, this is what the gardener, the vine dresser does. When we had the vineyard over here for many, many years, I would watch at the various seasons where the guy would come by, you know, the, the vineyard keeper, he would come by and he would prune the vine and so that they would have a better harvest of grapes. And so the picture here is that God is constantly pruning He's taking away areas that are unfruitful in the lives of his children. And he's constantly pruning those areas that are fruitful to bring more fruit. That's what he does. This is totally related to his children. The point of pruning any tree is that it become more fruitful. That's the essence of the parable that God wants his church, his people to become more fruitful, more relational, more fruit-bearing. Now, take a look at verse 3. 
I want you to notice that this parable is spoken to believers. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. This parable is not intended for unbelievers. It's for believers. Judas is not present. Like Elvis, he has left the building. It's true. If you go back, he's gone. He's left the building. Take a look at verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. This the last section. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Those, those words presuppose that you have Jesus. Do they not? Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's talking about those who have Jesus. And if you were to take a look at the larger context here, as you move through the various chapters, chapters 15, 16, and 17, this is, he goes on to talk about his disciples in relation to one another, his disciples in relation to the world, his disciples in relation to the Spirit of God, and his, his disciples' relationship to God the Father, God the Son, and their future glory. So the parable here is all focused on the children of God. And if you go back to chapter 14, it's about sending the Holy Spirit. Who is he sending the Holy Spirit to? And for his children. And, and so the, the point here is that he sends another helper, someone who aids in living the Christian life for us as believers. And that's what we don't want to miss here this morning because the Holy Spirit is the through part. He's the God part. The third person of the Blessed Trinity who's been sent to help us live in Christ and the resurrected life. And it's so, so important, important because we do it in our own strength, don't we? And we put the eyes in there all the time. So, if you, when, you, when you look at this parable, you want to think of union, and you want to think of staying in union. Uh, th this is why we encounter expressions like, uh, take a look at verse 4, abide in me. Uh, it's staying in union. Verse 7, if my words abide in you, staying in union. Uh, abide in my love, verse 9, staying in union. Uh, if you keep my commandments, verse 10, staying in union. So everything here is geared toward us staying in union with him. Because we were never meant to do it on our own. In, in fact, it's an impossibility. That's why we're all lousy Christians when we do it in our own strength. And, and what it becomes now is holy striving. I want to become more holy. Remember I said that last week? Holy striving is H-O-L-Y. It's going after things that we think are going to actually make us more godly. And it doesn't happen. It always blows up. I think what we need to take away here and understand is that holy striving is totally different from holy abiding. And it's living life in the Spirit. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Uh, yeah, big, big difference. When we abide in Him and we stay within Him, then we experience the power and the help of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Charles Stanley, in his book, Living Close to God, quotes another Pastor Jack Taylor, no relation to Hudson, by the way, that I'm aware of. But Jack Taylor, in his book, entitled, After the Spirit Comes, wrote, It may be said then, without being irreverent, that the Holy Spirit is for us the presence of Jesus Christ, the spiritual presence of Jesus himself. We are indwelt of the Spirit of God, who is the living essence of Jesus in us. 
the Holy Spirit carries on the ministry of Christ to us in Christ's absence. Uh, Stanley goes on to write, the Holy Spirit is more than a sensation or a feeling. He's a person. Quote, the same Spirit of God who abided in Jesus throughout his earthly ministry is the one who now abides in the heart of each believer. The, and I say, this is why Paul could write in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's why Paul could write it, because the Holy Spirit was sent abroad to live in our hearts. Take, take a look at verse 5 again here, very quickly. And I'm going to be redundant here, for redundancy's sake and emphasis. As I said, the whole parable is about union, fruitfulness, and abiding. Take, take a look at verse 5, and the last part of that verse, for apart from me, you can do nothing. If you think about it, this is entirely true in every which way. Now, you know the scriptures that Jesus is given all authority and power in heaven and in earth. We can't breathe unless God wills it. We can't have a beating heart here this morning unless God wills it. We can't love, live another second or moment unless God has ordained it. Amen? You know that. Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 confirms these truths. Quote, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. He, he controls and puts together, he can hold together the entire universe as I speak. And he holds your beating heart and my beating heart in his very hand. Um, Hebrews 1 uh, verse 3, he upholds all things by the power of his word. But when you come back to this phrase that you can do nothing without me, he wasn't talking about our beating hearts or our physical existence. He's talking about living the Christian life with fruitfulness. That's what he's saying. Now, <laughs> we've all seen the bumper sticker maybe from time to time, you know, God is my co-pilot. You've seen that, right? That's exactly what, not what this verse is saying. God can't be your co-pilot. Co if he's your co-pilot, then you're driving. <laughs> That's the problem. You see? That was the problem that I had this past week. I was driving. <laughs> and it didn't work out too well. So if God is your co-pilot, then the I is in your Christianity. And he's in the wrong driver's seat. You're in the wrong driver's seat. And if God is the pilot, then we have the God part in and the I part out. And I think that that's what we miss in our Christianity today. And this is why people burn out. This is why people don't want to serve anymore. This is why I've wanted to quit like every other Sunday, every fifth Sunday, every sixth Sunday, every first Sunday, second Sunday, third Sunday, fifth Sunday, sixth Sunday, and it goes on and on. And this is why sometimes you want to give up too. You know what I'm talking about. Because what happens is you burn out and you get tired, right? You get tired of the drill. And that's what I think our Christianity has become today. We don't, we don't rest in, in the Holy Spirit's work. We don't abide in Christ because we try to drive ourselves and we don't worship. And so when we're not worshiping and we're not abiding and we're not resting, it's a, train, it's a car wreck, or a train wreck, if you're the conductor. <laughs> Either one. Take your pick. And it's a mess. And that's why our churches are a mess, because we've been taught that we have to do it. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that we don't do, because the Bible's clear that we are to do. We'll talk about this next week. Jesus did. He did a lot in three years. But it was always in sync with his heavenly father, wasn't it? And that's where I, that's the problem that I ran into last week. It wasn't 
It, it wasn't in sync with the Spirit of God. And, and, and that's why it was not pretty last week. Now, in closing, I gave you two clues last week about the resurrected life. Uh, Hudson Taylor's testimony, he used the scripture. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That was the one clue. The other one was from our communion hymn. Remember we sang, He Lives. You ask me how we know, I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Those are the two clues. Those two clues also work for the through part. So we've come to the cross. God has taken our place. And it's in, 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 death, in, in death through the Holy Spirit. Now we are able to live the resurrected life. And we're going to uh, talk about that next week. And, and hopefully I have a better week next week than I did, or this week than I did last week. Amen? I'm going to give you a, a, one, one clue about the resurrection part. You've heard the word before. It's called surrender. It involves the I part. This is where the I part has to come in. Uh, one word, surrender, and, <laughs> you know, when you think of surrender, what do you think of? Waving the white flag, right? I'll, I got it. I got it. It's a handkerchief here. It's clean. Okay, it's clean. It's what it is. It's what we do, right? I surrender. Okay. It's more than that. We're going to talk about that. Uh, so, part three next week. Let us pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for the scriptures, not uh, that I have already obtained it, uh, but I press on. And that's true, Lord, for myself, and it's true for every saint here this morning. And thank you, Father, too, that in weakness uh, you are made strong. Um, and we're all so weak in many, many ways. May we embrace that weakness uh, that we might find your strength. Uh, to him be glory, praise, and honor, and dominion, uh, both now and forever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.